Avi, one of the great questions of humanity is, uh, are we alone? Are there other intelligent creatures in, in the universe? And uh, it's been a perennial question that uh, humans have asked. Uh, uh, I find scientists are, are actually on, on both sides of the issue. Uh, how should we begin to think about this question? What, what are some of the parameters we should use to evaluate this? Well, first of all, this is the most fundamental question that we can bring up in science because it has a very broad impact on society. Uh, in particular, if we ever find aliens out there, there will be new fields of research uh, on the interface of existing fields. For example, there would be astrolinguistics. How do we communicate with these aliens? Astrosociology, how do to interpret their behavior? Um, astroeconomics, how to trade about space resources, yeah. and but so forth. How about astro defense? Because some people are worried that if there are aliens and we signal them, they'll come here and eat us. Well, it would be prudent on our side to first listen before we speak. <laughs> you know. But uh, uh, I'm an optimist, and I believe that we will learn much more from them than vice versa. Uh, it would feel like cheating in an exam where you have some fundamental questions that you're being challenged to address, but then you find a very bright student next to you and you ask, uh, what's the solution to these questions? And it's possible that with uh, a billion more years to think about the nature of the dark matter, nature of dark energy, uh, other aspects of uh, physics that we haven't yet explored yet, they have great insights that we could use and make a shortcut in our progress. And that would be wonderful. Uh, perhaps we can cure all diseases. Uh, perhaps we can move into space much faster and reach points that are very far away in a short time. Um, and so it could address a set of problems that we currently have to which we don't have a solution. Given that, the fundamental question is, are we alone? And uh, my view is that we are not special, that uh, in fact, there is probably intelligence far more advanced than, than ours. It may not be on planets next to stars because as soon as technology develops beyond a certain point, uh, that civilization will move away from their planet. My own belief is that once we move away from the solar system, we might get a message from outside saying, welcome to the interstellar club. <laughs> Okay, uh, that, that uh, you know sounds very glorious, but um, but w w what are the scientists? Because we obviously haven't found anything yet. We've been listening somewhat in different ways. Um, and, and, so, but, so, what are the general characteristics to give some sort of a sense of what's out there, the the likely percentages, and you know, with the discovery of so many um, exoplanets, uh, many in the habitable zone, uh, in very recent times. Uh, uh, th that certainly is providing one of the elements in the development of intelligence has given us even more confidence. Yes, we know that um, about a quarter of Loma stars have habitable Earth-sized planets around them that could potentially uh, have liquid water on their surface and give birth to the chemistry of life as we know it. Uh, primitive life is therefore quite likely to exist elsewhere. As to intelligent life, uh, we cannot be sure because we don't fully understand how we came to exist. But um, an interesting question to ask is, from a practical point of view, what kind of signals should we be looking for beyond radio communication signals that we ourselves produced uh, over the past century? There is a spherical uh, uh, signal of radio waves that we transmitted that is uh, hundred, more than a hundred light years in size yeah. that could have reached uh, other civilizations by now and we might hear from them. Uh, and so other than that, what can we look for? Uh, it turns out that um, we could detect a city like Tokyo, an artificial light yeah. producer of the size of, of Tokyo all the way out to the edge of the solar system with our existing telescopes. Uh, there might be nothing there, but there might also be a spacecraft passing by that we could look for. Um, beyond artificial lights, uh, we could look, for example, for um, artifacts on the surface of a planet. For example, solar cells, uh, photovoltaic cells that are used to collect starlight and convert it into electricity or other forms of radiation. Uh, how do we search for that? 
Well, uh, vegetation has um, the so-called red edge where uh, it doesn't make use of infrared light. Uh, photosynthesis makes use of ultraviolet light and so the plants simply reflect the photons that they don't need, uh, which are long wavelength photons. And when you look at the uh, Earth from a distance, you see a spectral edge uh, where the reflectance of the Earth rises sharply at infrared wavelengths. That's due to vegetation. The same applies to photovoltaic cells. So how uh, far out can you see that? Oh, that you can see in principle uh, on many exoplanets that we know exist in the habitable zone. Uh, and it's you just do that, that by, by looking at the spectrograph of the atmosphere through the starlight of the host star? No, uh, what you look for is the reflected sunlight, uh, which is uh, a bit more challenging, uh, uh, but it can be done with future telescopes uh, for at least the nearby planets. Um, for example, there is a habitable planet around the Proxima Centauri, the nearest star. It's about four light years about four light years away. And um, we could, in principle, see this uh, red edge signature with the yeah. James Webb Space Telescope. Uh -huh. um, and in addition, we could search for the spectral edge that is not coming, originating from uh, natural vegetation, uh, but is associated with photovoltaic cells. So that's one possible artifact. Okay, so, but, but, but the argument is that e even if, um, even if primitive life, grass or, or, or vegetation is, is common, um, that intelligent life is extremely rare. Uh, and some evolutionary biologists say that you take the whole universe and multiply all the percentages and you, you still don't have enough time for evolution uh, to work again. Assuming that we are really special, it's true that um, intelligent life on Earth came relatively late in the evolution of the Earth. However, the only place where we know life exists has both types, uh, intelligent and primitive. Uh, until we find more examples, we will never know. So I think we should be open-minded and explore both uh, primitive and intelligent life in our search. So and one, one other way to, to find uh, intelligent life, for example, is industrial pollution of atmospheres. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people are thinking about looking for molecules like oxygen that are byproducts of primitive life, yeah. but potentially you can look for much bigger molecules that are artificially produced by industri industries. Yeah, that's good. Now, the big question, of course, to all of this, which sounds wonderful, is the so-called Fermi paradox, that um, all this is great, all these statistics are fine, number of exoplanets and likelihood and all that, but, you know, where are they? We don't, we don't, we don't see them. Now, we know that life maximally took four billion years on Earth, something like that, and, and, and um, uh, intelligent life in the last, uh, you know, few hundred million years and in human life is much shorter than that. And there's plenty of time for that in the universe. And you've been one of the pioneers in early stars and they had, so this uh, arguably 13 billion years because the universe was almost 14 and at least 13 billion years of time to, for all this to happen. And we don't see anything, and especially if you think that intelligent life after a period of time can reproduce itself. Uh, uh, through artificial intelligence, sent out probes, so-called von Neumann probes, and they would multiply exponentially and be able to, you know, calculation show, fill our galaxy in a million years. Right. But the signals may be very subtle. Uh, even a nuclear war would be hardly detectable uh, within the solar system and not detectable at all at the nearest uh, planet to Earth. Uh, and so uh, we perhaps need to develop sensitive enough observatories and at some point, once we reach the threshold where we are sensitive enough to those subtle signals, we will see them all around. That's one possible solution to the Fermi paradox. Another one is that we may not be of interest. Uh, just like um, as you walk down the street, uh, you don't pay attention to ants that walk on the pavement uh, because they're rather primitive, they don't affect your um, planning for the day. Uh, and so we might be of completely peripheral importance. Uh, and so they are not approaching us. They realize that we exist, but we are um, just, you know, the relatively um, 
not so intelligent kids in, in, in the neighborhood. Uh, now, uh, there are many other possible solutions to the Fermi paradox. My approach is that we should explore without prejudice. Uh, a lot of times astronomers thought they knew the answer in advance before looking up in the sky. And that prevented progress. So I'm completely agnostic. I think we should just develop the technologies that allow us to detect the, mo the, the faintest signals and be open-minded.